Hi everyone and welcome to today's session on the future of work. We're pleased that so many of you have been able to join us today. So let's start with some introductions. My name is Emma Kappa and I'm a partner in the employment team and I'm joined by my colleague Mini Chandramuli who is a senior associate also in the employment team. This session is the second in our autumn programme of interactive webinars hosted by Field Fisher's Employment, Pensions, Immigration and Compliance Team, also known as EPIC. Today, we're going to look at the future of work. Back in March, many businesses had to make the move to home working pretty much overnight. There was probably not much detailed thought as to where an employee was working beyond the obvious. Do they have a desk? a chair, IT equipment, and Wi-Fi. There was an initial expectation that it would be temporary, that the pandemic would be brought under control and we would return to our previous way of living and working. But as the weeks and the months have passed, we've realized that we're unlikely to return to our lives as we knew them at the beginning of 2020. And so businesses have begun to reflect and adapt. Can our business work well rather than just survive? if our employees work from home most of the time with minimal attendance in the workplace. And likewise, employees have thought about what they want their day-to-day -day lives to look like. Some thrive on being physically with their colleagues and can't wait for a meaningful return to the office, whilst others enjoy the quiet that a home environment affords them and have no desire at all to return to their daily commute. Now we know from speaking with clients that businesses are looking at how to achieve the right balance, but there is definitely appetite for change. One recent survey revealed that 82% of UK businesses plan to maintain or increase remote working arrangements. So the purpose of today's session is to help you navigate the issues that arise from more permanent home working arrangements. Now there really are a lot of things to consider from both a legal and a practical perspective. So this session is really just about trying to signpost those for you. I'm going to hand over to Minnie now to take you through the specifics of what we're going to cover today. Thank you, Emma. This is a topic we could talk about for hours in the world of COVID-19. Given we only have half an hour, today we are going to just focus on two key questions which employers should know the answers to as we move into 2021 and a world of permanent home working arrangements. The first question is, how to affect the change to home working? What can an employer legally do if an employee asks to work from home permanently? Or alternatively, what should an employer do if it decides that it wants its employees to work from home permanently? We will discuss the two key contractual mechanisms available to implement this type of change, flexible working requests and mobility clauses. The second question is, what are the key legal and practical risks associated with an employee working from home permanently on either a part-time or full-time basis? We will discuss the employment and tax risks associated with this new phenomenon of employees working from anywhere and health and safety considerations. The implications are wide reaching and we want to flag some issues for you to keep in mind. We will also discuss the practical challenges of monitoring productivity and performance and how to provide support and mentoring for junior employees. There'll be time for questions at the end. If you have any questions, please use the question box in your control panel on the right hand side of the screen and we'll aim to get through as many as possible. If we don't get time to answer all the questions, one of us or one of your usual Field Fisher contacts will follow up with you individually after the session. All our sessions are recorded and available on the Field Fisher website and YouTube channel. So let's get started. The first question we will deal with is what an employer can do if an employee asks to work from home permanently on either a full-time or part-time basis. Agile working and home working are not new concepts, although they have become a necessity during the pandemic. There have always been ways to formally implement these changes into an employee's contract. The first way may come about when an employee requests to work from home permanently through a flexible working request. A survey conducted by Cardiff University revealed that almost 90% of workers would like to continue working from home in some capacity 
even when social distancing measures will not require them to do so. Therefore, as the pandemic retreats, hopefully, and employees begin to ask more employees to return to the office, they are likely to receive an increase in flexible working requests from employees asking to work from home on some type of permanent basis. Some employers may wish to deal with these through a more informal route, and depending on the size of your organisation, this might be appropriate. If adopting the informal route, in order to limit scope for later disputes, it will be important to set out guidance in order to ensure the consistency of decisions and to always recall the specific arrangement agreed and when it will be reviewed if it's not working for either party. If the informal route is not appropriate, perhaps due to the size of your workforce, you can deal with requests to work from home under the framework of the Employment Rights Act. The process under the Act is more stringent and time consuming and therefore would only be recommended if homeworking was not something the employer wanted to allow universally. Under the Act, employees with at least 26 week continuous employment can make a request for flexible working for any reason. I emphasise any reason to dispel the thinking that employees need a specific type of reason to make a request, like childcare arrangements, although a cogent reason may make their request more difficult to refuse. This slide demonstrates the procedure which must be followed by an employer when responding to a request under the Act. It is generally straightforward, so I won't go through this in detail. However, I will flag just a couple of points. Although the legislation does not mention trial periods, we would always recommend that parties agree to a trial period, particularly where the employer is unsure about how a change will work in practice. And secondly, if a request is made under, an act, under the Act, an employer can only refuse the, the request for one or more of the eight reasons set out in the legislation. These are set out on the slide there. Employees can make a claim in the employment tribunal if they believe their request has not been dealt with in accordance with the framework under the Act. Employees should also be aware that some employees may be able to make a discrimination claim if they are seeking a flexible working arrangement for the purposes of, for example, childcare permits, their disability or the disability of someone else or religious requirements. This is regardless of whether they've made their request through an informal process, under a policy, or under the Fair Equal Employment Rights Act. Now, there is another option to manage an influx of these types of requests, particularly where your organisation is keen to allow permanent home working to some extent by its employees. Employers can introduce an agile working or home working policy. This policy would apply across the organisation or to appropriate roles within the organisation and would enable the company to set consistent parameters around homeworking and reduce the administrative burden of managing individual requests. For example, the policy may provide that employees can work from home two days a week with the days to be agreed with their line manager. We are seeing this approach adopted much more frequently as it is likely to be a much more efficient way to proceed. Some employers may already have this type of policy in place prior to the pandemic. However, many of those policies would have been drafted when a very small proportion of the workforce was home working for more than one day a week. This may need to be reviewed and updated given the wider scale of home working. Now, let's move on to what employers should consider if they are contemplating requiring their employees to work from home permanently. The first matter an employer should check is whether their contracts of employment contain an appropriate mobility clause to allow them to require this change without having to seek the employee's consent. A mobility clause is a clause like the one up on the slide, which gives an employer flexibility to change the employee's place of work unless this is unreasonable. This type of clause is often used when an employer moves offices and provided the office is within a reasonable distance of its previous premises, it's normally fine to rely on this clause. However, if it is being utilised to require employees to work from home permanently, and this is not expressly provided for within the clause, then implementing this change in this way will come with a level of risk. The reason being that 
requiring an employee to work from home permanently using a mobility clause when this is not their preference may not in fact be considered reasonable. Working from home permanently is not viable for many. There may be inadequate space or facilities to work from home. It may mean sharing the space with young children or other family members. It means reduced face-to-face -face contact with colleagues and mentors, reduced opportunity for collaboration, and combining your home and workspace can impact mental health. If a company is keen on requiring employees to work from home permanently, for example, because it does not want to keep its office open and there is no mobility clause, or it is not able to be reasonably used, then technically a workplace closure would be a redundancy and a redundancy consultation process should be followed. As an alternative, an employer might tactically want to try and treat a move to home working in such a situation as a change to terms and conditions. There might also be a change to terms where an employer only wants to move to partial home working. This is a complex area and specific advice should be taken. Remember that either way, if more than 20 dismissals are proposed in a 90 day period, in a redundancy situation, or if a change to terms cannot be done with consent, this would trigger obligations to inform and consult on a collective basis. Failure to do so can result in significant, pen significant penalties up of up to 90 days gross pay per employee. Okay, enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Emma to look at some of the key legal and practical risks associated with more permanent home working. Okay, thanks Minnie. <clears throat> there are two key areas here that I want to focus on. The first is where is the employee going to be undertaking the work? And by that, I'm thinking particularly about those employees who want to sit in another jurisdiction somewhere overseas. What does this mean in terms of an employer's obligations or the impact on the employer? And then we'll move on to look at how an employer ensures that it's complying with its health and safety obligations to provide a safe workplace where an employee is working in the home. So let's look first at working abroad. We've had quite a few clients tell us that their employees have been working overseas during the pandemic with or without their employer's consent. The mindset uh, seems to have been, well, what difference does it make if I work from my home in the UK or a villa in Italy? As long as I'm getting the work done, why should my employer mind where I'm doing it? Well, it makes a big difference from a legal perspective. If an employee lives and works abroad, they can accrue mandatory employment rights under the law of that country. This might include things like minimum rates of pay, holidays, and potentially rights on termination of employment. So, as you might imagine, this is quite problematic potentially. And whilst the employee might not be initially aware of these issues, if the relationship deteriorates, they are likely to be raised by them at some point. There are also likely to be dual health and safety obligations. Different countries in the EU for example, have different standards for what must be provided for an employee to enable them to work safely from home. It's also important that your contracts of employment reflect the correct position. Here in the UK, an employer must record an employee's place of work in the employee's contract of employment, along with any requirement to work outside the UK for a continuous period of one month or more. Practical arrangements also need to be thought about and recorded in contracts or uh, letters of amendment. And that will include, for example, the requirement to travel back to the UK for meetings and how often that has to happen, together with the position on expenses in connection with traveling and any accommodation costs. You also need to think about any time zones and the implications on an employee's hours of work. Where would the employee like to work from? And is this going to cause any difficulties with them being available during normal UK working hours? You also need to think about the position regarding benefits. So can the employee legally participate in the company's pension scheme or other benefits such as life assurance or private medical? if they're working from another jurisdiction? And will those benefits be effective for them anyway? And whilst we're not focusing on immigration here today, 
it's worth just remembering that there may well be immigration consequences of an employee working abroad. And so if you'd like to chat to one of our immigration colleagues about that, please let us know. There's also a slightly separate point to remember here, and that is if a UK employer decides to deliberately outsource a service to another jurisdiction, the TUPI regulations may still apply. And so don't forget to speak to one of our team who can help with the implications of such an outsourcing. So we've touched on the employment law issues associated with employees working from abroad and the risks that this creates for employers. From a tax perspective, working from abroad also gives rise to some very significant implications. Employers need to be very careful when allowing remote working overseas. There can be serious issues about where tax and social security should be paid, and there are also corporate tax risks. Now, I'm not a tax specialist, but we've been working on these types of issues closely with our tax team in recent months. And so I just wanted to highlight some of the key issues that can arise here. In short, in the UK, employers must deduct income tax through PAYE as long as the employee is UK tax resident. But what happens if the employee is not always resident in the UK? Well, this might change the employee's tax residency. Every country has its own rules. And when an employee works in another country, they may, be tax, they may become tax resident in that country. And if that happens, an employer may need to pay tax in the country where the employee is tax resident rather than the UK. That can apply even if your employee is on a UK employment contract. Now, whilst short term stints working overseas will usually be OK, problems can start to arise if an arrangement becomes more long term. There are very specific thresholds here for the number of days spent resident in another jurisdiction and at what point the employee becomes tax resident in that country before income tax is payable there. There can be further complications if an employee becomes what's known as dual tax resident, i.e. there are obligations to pay tax both abroad and in the UK. And just to add some further complexity, the rules for national insurance contributions or social security are different again. Separately then, there are the corporate tax risks. Companies that employ workers based abroad may in certain circumstances be in danger of inadvertently creating a permanent establishment in a country where they're not otherwise based and where they never intended to be taxed. This can have serious tax planning consequences for the business. For example, the business may be obliged to pay corporation tax on profits arising from the employee's work in the country where they are based. These issues are incredibly time consuming, not only to keep track of, but also to deal with as they arise. And if you get all this wrong, well, it can be very expensive. So from a tax perspective, you really need to be giving serious consideration to allowing your employees, to whether you allow your employees to work from home uh, in other jurisdictions. And this is definitely an area where you should seek some specific advice. So if you want to speak to one of our tax team, please do let us know. Right, let's finally look at health and safety here. It's difficult to have much control on an employee's home working space, but the Health and Safety at Work Act imposes a general duty on employers to ensure the health, safety and welfare at work of all of their employees as far as is reasonably practicable. In addition to their statutory duties, all employers have a common law duty of care to provide employees with a safe system of work. Now, the speed at which lockdown was put in place initially in March meant that employers were unlikely to have been able to conduct checks on their employees' home working spaces. Many employees will use display screen equipment, such as computers, laptops and smartphones. Display screen equipment risks should be controlled as far as reasonably practicable as they would in the usual working environment. Employers should provide workers with advice on completing their own basic assessment at home. And these assessments should be returned to the employer who, depending on the outcome of the assessment, must decide whether specialist equipment is required for a particular worker. Where an employee decides to work from home on a long term basis, employers should establish a system for carrying out regular risk assessments to check that the employee's working environment is safe. 
This may need to be undertaken remotely, for example, by video conference. In considering health and safety, mental health is equally important as physical health. The media has reported relatively high levels of stress and anxiety during the COVID-19 pandemic. And there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that during lockdown, some employees have found it more challenging to switch off and to delineate between the working day and downtime. Equally, the virtual environment can make it more difficult for employers to identify when an employee is struggling. Employees with pre-existing mental health conditions may find these circumstances aggravate their condition. Now, as employers have a legal responsibility to undertake risk assessments and take steps to ensure the working environment remains safe, for employees with pre-existing conditions, this may mean taking steps to ensure that the risks of exacerbating any conditions are reduced. Now, it's not only difficult to identify these risks in the current climate, but it's difficult to manage them. And if you're unsure, then you should seek advice on these issues. I'm going to hand over Minnie now just to summarise some of the more practical challenges of home working. Thanks, Emma. As many of you may have already experienced, there are a number of practical challenges to home working, which have been magnified by the fact that employees started working from home during the pandemic overnight before employers had a chance to put the appropriate procedures and policies in place. A usual concern that comes up with employees requesting to work from home is, how will I know whether they are being productive? Now, if you don't work in a law firm where we record our time in six minute increments, then you may be inclined to explore ways to ensure your team remains busy. The media reported a story at one company where staff at home were told to keep a video conference call open all day so a manager could watch what they were doing and issue any orders that popped into his head as he always did in the office. Given employees are in the home, that probably wouldn't be our recommended approach. You may have heard about tracking software such that will count keystrokes on the laptop or take random screenshots of a monitor to make sure employees are actually working from home. However, these types of tools are considered particularly intrusive and impermissible in the privacy world, even if installed on a company-owned laptop, and as a general rule, should not be used to monitor productivity. In order to manage productivity, an employer must adopt an approach that is proportionate to this purpose and would include things like asking employees to complete a timesheet at the end of the day, providing employees with a clear list of tasks for the week which should keep them busy and keeping track of their progress, regular team meetings and or individual check-in meetings, and being clear about something as basic and fundamental as what hours the employee will be working. Will it be nine to five or will it be something else? The virtual working environment arguably does not afford the same opportunities for learning, support and collaboration that are experienced in the office environment, particularly for more junior employees who might otherwise learn through observing and job shadowing more senior employees. This is a good reason for employees to consider, consider whether it is appropriate for junior employees to work from home on a permanent basis once coronavirus restriction ease. Okay, so that concludes the main part of the presentation. We have some time for questions now. I've been looking at the questions throughout the presentation to see what has grabbed people's interest. So I'll start with the first question. We have been hearing about more people moving out of London or other major cities where cost of living is high and working from at home in areas of England where cost of living is lower. Is an employer justified in reducing an employee's salary if they ask to work from home permanently, given their cost of living won't be so high? Okay, so that's a good question, Minnie, and one that we're starting to hear quite frequently from clients. Um, I suppose if an employee isn't spending as much on travel to work, then can that cost be deducted from their pay? That's the question that we're commonly seeing. Now, pay is one of those fundamental terms of an employment contract. Um, it's not going to be lawful to unilaterally seek to reduce it necessarily. So you're likely to need to approach this question uh, in terms of seeking consent. Now, I think the important thing to consider here is probably who is driving the change for home working. So if the employee is asking to make the change because it suits their personal circumstances, 
then the employer might be on a better footing to ask them to take a pay cut uh, as a sort of quid pro quo for the changes to their place of work. But there might be some difficulty if an employer is saying that the employee needs to work from home and take reduced salary as well, unless, of course, redundancies might be a sort of stark alternative to that. So I would say look at the specific circumstances, look at the bargaining position of the parties um, before you uh, approach that question. Hopefully that answers that one, Minnie. Have we got any others? Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, there, there are a couple of others. OK, um, the second question is, do I need to amend our policies to accommodate home working? And if so, which ones? OK, um, right. Well, there are, are a number of policies that you need to um, probably go back and have a look at. So Minnie's already flagged. You might be putting in place a remote working or home working or agile working policy to implement whatever your strategy is going to be. There's lots of different labels for those. But then you need to go back and revisit things like your information and security um, policy, employee monitoring policies from a data protection perspective. Um, you might find that things like disciplinary and grievance procedures specifically refer to in-person meetings. So those might need to be adapted. And sickness absence policies might also refer to in-person attendance um, in the workplace, and that might need changing too. Um, I suppose the other thing that occurs to me here whilst we're talking about looking at those kind of policies is um, benefit provision, actually. So you might find that you have particular benefits like season ticket loans or benefits um, based on the employee's location in the workplace. So gym benefits for gyms near the office, on-site childcare provision, you might subsidise food. All of that might need reviewing um, if you're going to move to home working. Thanks, Emma. And I think, a quick one. Yeah, I'll try and fit in one more. Um, is there anything in particular we should do in terms of documenting a change if you're if we're going to allow an employee to work abroad? Yeah, OK. Um, I, I think absolutely you should be looking to put in place um, some documentation around that. The things you might want to look at including are um, an initial trial period, for example. So you might want to write to get the employee to revert back to working in the UK um, if it doesn't work out. You might want to set out the position in relation to tax. So if there are additional tax deductions, um, they would have to um, uh, essentially account for those. Um, you might need to set out the position in relation to technology and what extra technology they might need to be able to work practically abroad. And indeed the position around returning to the UK for any in-person meetings and who pays for that. I think that's probably all we've got time for on the question front, Minnie. Do you want to just wrap up? Thank you. Yes, um, I think that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, so thank you everyone for joining today's session on the future of work. We hope you found it useful. All our sessions are recorded and can be found on our website and on the Field Fisher YouTube channel. I'm sorry if we didn't manage to get to your questions. If you had questions which we were not able to answer or you would like to discuss any aspect of this topic further, your usual Field Fisher contacts will follow up with you individually. Before we finish, I just want to mention that we have been hosting 30-minute sessions covering the current employment hot, hot topics throughout autumn. Our last session was in October and was about diversity and positive action. In case you missed it, a recording is available on YouTube and through our website. There is one further employment session which is scheduled for 3 December on forward planning, what can UK employees expect in 2021, which will look at the impact recent cases are likely to have on business and key employment changes anticipated in 2021. Our immigration and pension colleagues are also working through topics in their respective fields. The next immigration webinar is tomorrow on immigration changes and the impact on international students, which will offer practical advice for employers. We hope you can join for one or more of these sessions and thank you for attending today. Goodbye.